advantage of God's grace and mercy. So much, of, so many people are going out today, just living day by day, and forgetting where this all comes from. One thing I remember Reverend Foster saying was the question, "How do you know Jesus is real?" And one of the answers was, "Because everything points up to Him." When the grass, when the grass grows, it grows up. Flowers grow up. Trees grow up. Our houses stand up. And no matter what we're doing, there's always something above us. And that's God looking down on us to see what it is and what we aren't doing that we need to be doing. You know, I heard something last week. I was complaining in my mind about some stuff going on. And I know you're not supposed to complain, but as I was complaining, because I'm human, a lady, I was in the lift car, and a lady said, she just started talking, and she said, you know, I got a saying, I said, God, I ain't complaining, I'm just explaining. <laughs> and I started, I looked up, and, and the lady, we just started having such a good conversation in the back of this lift car about God and his grace and his mercy, and it just all, it hit me. Like all this stuff that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis, people that we meet, people we disagree with, people that we love, it's, it's seeds that we're taking from each and every one of those people that's embedded in us, and we grow. You know, I just don't want God to touch me here and there. You know, I want him to be in me. I want to be covered by his grace and mercy. I want to talk to God on a daily basis, not because I'm going through something, just because I can and I'm able. I know who you are. We know who you are. You know, we got to get down on our knees in the morning and just say, thank you, Lord. You know, that song is something about that name, Jesus. You know, it's something about it when you call it, it just... It runs up to your soul. It runs up. I don't care what's going on. You say, Jesus! People may look at you. Some people know what you're talking about, but it brings a sense of comfort over your body, over your soul. And you just keep on going. You know, stuff be happening. You be working. And I got to get this done. I got to get this done. I got to be out of here by this time. But Jesus will make it all, all smooth like butter. But I tell you what, the phrase keep on living. It sure ain't make sense to like that love. And like Deacon Red was saying that you know the devil messes with you and take a little bit from you. And you be down on your knees and be broken. But you keep on believing. Don't give up. Don't lose faith because God is going to be right there. And then when he comes, he's going to hit you and make you feel so good. You start smiling again. You start walking how you used to walk. But you start singing and whistling. And, you know, just now you have to realize God has me. And I'm not going to ever let go of who he is. I'm going to talk about him every day. I'm going to pray to him every day. Yeah. With all that being said, I just, everyone just please just, when you leave this place or when you go home or when you just by yourself, just call on his name. Yeah. When you have conversations with your, your child or your niece or your nephew, bring them up. You may have to get on your children like I got on mine this morning, but it's all out of love. Yeah. I'm doing it because I love you. I'm doing it because it came from my parents, from my from my parents, from my grandparents. And it's nothing like Christian unity, Lord. It's nothing like it. Yeah. We came so far. Yeah. We've grown so much. Yeah. And all we just need to do is just keep on praying on this yeah. on this Broadway Avenue. Yeah. Where the neon light shine bright. Yeah. You know, it was funny where we came from. And I mention it all the time. It was so cold in there some Sunday, but we just kept it. the word of Jesus flowing through those small four walls. And you forgot.
forgot about how cold it was because it was so wrapped up in the Holy Ghost. Yes, yes, yes. When we got out of there, it was like, whoo! Steam coming off my forehead. But Lord, I just want to say thank you so much for all that you've done, all that you're going to continue to do. And I ain't complaining, Lord. I'm just going to keep on explaining. Because <laughs> it all makes sense now. I love you. I love you. And I love you some more, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Here we go. 
Immediately I was in the spirit, and there was a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on it. The one seated there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the throne sat twenty-four elders, dressed in white clothes with, ground, with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumbling and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back were around the throne on each side. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had the face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. And they were covered with eyes around the inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before the one seated on the throne, and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, O Lord, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive the glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Amen. 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 May God bless the being and hearing of this holy word. You can be seated. It's a lot going on right there, thanks to God. But today, this message is going to be more instructional, but it's still what I believe necessary. Because what we have to understand here is that we're being prepared to be citizens of heaven. And worship is something that we all need to learn how to do. Worship is not dropping down on one knee saying, Lord, help me. In some cases, that's begging because you knew you weren't supposed to do it in the first place. The thing about it is, worship is giving God his due. It's ascribing worth to who God is, being the creator and sustainer of the entire universe and from whom we have our very being. So we need to learn how to worship. That is, we lay, relax, release, and let God have his way with us. And this, this chapter in particular, being at the throne, they're learning, and we're learning from them how to worship God. Because believe it or not, everybody that's a Christian should have the end point destination of being in heaven and glory with God. The thing about it is, is that what do you think we're going to be doing? We're going to be worshiping God. And we learn from these creatures and, and these twelve and these 24 people, elders, that we're going to be worshiping God all the time. That's what we created for. Angels do something totally different. I don't have time for that. But the thing about it is, is that this is a central proclamation of heavenly worship. It's God, the creator of all things, and the one who causes creation to exist. So, so many people really believe that they're the captain of their destiny, the master of their fate, when in reality, if you don't have Jesus, your fate ends up being fatal. And the thing about it is, the God of the Bible is not the creator who creates and then abandons the world he created. See, God would not bring us this far to leave us. You've heard that before, right? God does not turn his back on us. We turn our back on him. See, the thing about it is, thanks to God, God continues to sustain and watch over the world and God's people. He is worth more than any silver, gold, platinum, emerald, rubies, and or diamonds. So many people think that they can buy their way into heaven or they believe that they're better blessed because they are better dressed or have more than the next person. If you don't have Jesus, you really pretty much have nothing. The only moth and rust is going to destroy you anyway. And it is God alone that is worthy of our worship. We talked about that last week. You shouldn't worship your children, you shouldn't worship your spouse, you shouldn't worship your car, you shouldn't worship your job, and you for sure should not worship your bank account. All of your faith and hope should be in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who provides and sustains for us all. He alone is worthy of our praise. It's all right to recognize the accomplishments of other people, and a lot of people struggle with that. They want to tell you about everything that went wrong. I'm so tired of these broken Negroes. They always got to tell you about something that wasn't right. Why don't they focus on the stuff that's good? I'm so tired of people who are so messed up that they want to mess up 
everything else for everybody else. Do you realize as soon as you put a person in it, everything got flawed? But if the whole event was a success, if the whole occurrence was a success, why are you focused on one little thing, ye little-minded, impudent fool? <laughs> you just got to find some room, and some of y'all are here laughing, and then why? There's going to be somebody when Jesus comes back that's going to say, I don't know if I'm ready yet. Can you stop? Because what you're doing, I need something else to do. So the thing about being saints of God, Revelation shows us a vision of blasphemous forces represented by the dragons and the beast who seek to destroy the creation and usurp for themselves the worship due only to God and the Lamb. Do you realize that cults and a lot of things in this world want you to worship them? That's why they got all this. And you write the checks to them. Ain't that amazing? But the thing about it is, all of your worship should be going to God and Jesus. And we can't let the negative forces of life block our connection to Christ. We cannot let the situations in our lives make us curse God and die. We cannot allow others to tell us that because we struggle, God is not real. There's so many people in this world right now just because somebody died that was close to them think that God is not real. There's so many people who think because somebody is sick or they have an illness that God is not real. Do you realize that God can take anything? Did not. If we can if be coming to Bible study, we would study, we study the book of Acts. And after Stephen was stoned to death, the church got a chance to spread out. There was a diaspora after he was stoned to death. They left that spot. God, whatever we think about the message we had in Bible study, what the enemy meant for evil, God what? will work it out for our good. We need to stop looking with earthly eyes on the transparencies and the things that happen in our lives and start to try to look at God to see how these things are trying to transform us to be more heavenly minded so that we can be of more worth on this earth. See, so many people think just because they're going through things, God is not getting to them. Actually, they're going through those things. It's kind of like different cuts of meat. Some meat you cut real, cut real quick. Some meat you got to braise it, then cook it in the oven, and pray that you can still cut it when you're done. The thing about it is, is this. Sometimes we're blocking our blessing because we're focused on trying to do something that God does not want us to do. And how do you know this? Say, Pastor, how do you know this? Because every time you try to do it, it don't go right. And some of us don't learn. Some people don't understand. Mm -hmm. You understand that old story about when well, the baby touched the stove one time, they won't touch it again? Yeah, you're right. But they could they not, unless the baby is really stupid. Now, some of y'all, mm -hmm. I ain't talking about you if you was that baby. I keep that to yourself. But the thing about it is, most of the time, when we hurt ourselves, we tend to learn from that. And until we engage in life, we won't know what pain is to know the certain things we're not supposed to do. Oftentimes, we're so focused on trying to have a plan for something that we never consulted God to get this plan. And then we let people tell us that God is not real because the plan didn't manifest. That ain't the plan that God has for you. People get caught up with God not answering my prayers because you ain't praying the prayers that he wants you to have. Because if you notice in God's archetypal prayer, it says, let thy will be done. That means his will, not yours. The things you're praying for are your will. What Terry A. Well won't matters not. It's what does God want for Terry A. Well. If truth be told, most of us in here who God is blessed in any kind of way, the blessing that you got didn't come the way that you thought it was going to come. It came in the way that God wanted it to come so you would, guess what, know that he is in charge. We cannot let ourselves become so busy that we cannot make time to worship God. There's so many people not trying to be entrepreneurial. And I know I said entrepreneurial. Yeah. Everybody don't want to work for nobody. But everybody's so busy, they don't want to do no work for God. They so full of it. Whatever it is, you figure it out. But the thing about it is, is this. We cannot be so busy that we can never find time for God. Because if you haven't really been listening, he found time to let you breathe. He found time to let you have life and being. He found time to give you something to eat this morning. Your teeth either rented or yours. You ate. It matters not. 
God has blessed you with so many things and you're in your being and giving you things and people around you to care for you. And the thing about it is, some of us, if we really be truthful, we're really crass, crude individuals and there's somebody that God put in our lives that still loves us. Amen. Some people just have a hustler mentality with a foolish outlook. And people still love them. Their mama still cry at their funeral. Partly because she made that mess, but still, the thing about it is, we cannot leave God out of our lives. And the thing about it is, something we have to understand from this passage of scripture to the elders. Think about this. The elders are li- and the living creatures are worshiping God. And I'm going to explain to you what those are in a minute. See, those who will not humble themselves and accept Christ as their Savior will bow down to the beast. This is why I love it when I hear these young people. Can't nobody tell me what to do. Then all of a sudden their favorite color is orange and they tell them when to go to the bathroom when to do everything. Uh-huh. The thing about it is you always will answer to somebody in some way, shape, or form. Everybody answers to somebody. I love it when we get these people. Can't nobody tell me what to do. Well, I tell you what. A time is coming that you're going to be in eternity doing what somebody wants you to do and you might not even want the outcome from what's going to happen because you're going to torture it like that for all of eternity. If you cannot listen to anyone, then you can't help anyone. All right. If you cannot listen to anyone, then you cannot grow. You cannot change. I love it when people say, you don't understand what I've been through. I won't if you won't tell nobody what you've been through. And stop living in where you were and see where you are right now. It's just like a plant that we're going to buy for our yards in, in March and April. They're being transplanted from where they are right now into a new yard. And guess what? Every time you feed and water that plant, that plant ain't never left you a notice to say, where did I come from? <laughs> the thing about it is, there are people who will be unwilling to reconcile with God. That sin means more to them than their salvation. Their ability to humble themselves and admit they are broken and need Christ is real. But they don't want to accept it. Because they feel that they are actually captain of their fate and master of their destiny. See, I don't want anybody to get it twisted. God don't want us to be weaklings. God don't want us to be weaklings that are in the corner cowering down just because life ain't going the way we want to go. God wants us to live victoriously. That is claiming faith and doing the things that he wants us to do. Our faith and our victory should be tied up in what God wants for us. Letting his will be done if you're on your way to glory. Yeah. See, there are individuals who believe that it is in their best interest. Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, O Lord, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive the glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Amen. May God bless the reading and hearing of this holy word. You can be seated. It's a lot going on right there, thanks to God. But today, this message is going to be more instructional, but it's still what I believe necessary. Because what we have to understand here is that we're being prepared to be citizens of heaven. And worship is something that we all need to learn how to do. Worship is not dropping down on one knee saying, Lord, help me. In some cases, that's begging because you knew you weren't supposed to do it in the first place. The thing about it is, worship is giving God his due. It's ascribing worth to who God is, being the creator and sustainer of the entire universe and from whom we have our very being. So we need to learn how to worship. That is, relate, relax, release, and let God have his way with us. And this, this chapter in particular, being at the throne, they're learning, and we're learning from them how to worship God. Because believe it or not, everybody that's a Christian should have the end point destination of being in heaven and glory with God. The thing about it is that we think we're going to be doing, we're going to be worshiping God. And we learn from these creatures and, and these twelve and these 24 people, elders, that we're going to be worshiping God all the time. That's what we created for. Angels do something totally different. I don't have time for that. But the thing about it is, is that this is a central proclamation of heavenly worship. It's God, the creator of all things, and the one who causes creation to exist. 
So, so many people really believe that they're the captain of their destiny, the master of their fate, when in reality, if you don't have Jesus, your fate ends up being fatal. And the thing about it is, the God of the Bible is not the creator who creates and then abandoned the world he created. See, God would not bring us this far to leave us. You've heard that before, right? God does not turn his back on us. We turn our back on him. See, the thing about it is, thanks to God, God continues to sustain and watch over the world and God's people. He is worth more than any silver, gold, platinum, emerald, rubies, and or diamonds. So many people think that they can buy their way into heaven or they believe that they're better blessed because they are better dressed or have more than the next person. If you don't have Jesus, you really pretty much have nothing. There's only moth and rust is going to destroy anyway. And it is God alone that is worthy of our worship. We talked about that last week. You shouldn't worship your children. You shouldn't worship your spouse. You shouldn't worship your car. You shouldn't worship your job. And you for sure should not worship your bank account. All of your faith and hope should be in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who provides and sustains for us all. He alone is worthy of our praise. It's all right to recognize the accomplishments of other people, and a lot of people struggle with that. They want to tell you about everything that went wrong. I'm so tired of these broken Negroes that always got to tell you about something that wasn't right. Why don't they focus on the stuff that's good? I'm so tired of people who are so messed up that they want to mess up everything else for everybody else. Yeah. Do you realize as soon as you put a person in it, everything got flawed? Yeah. But if the whole event was a success, if the whole occurrence was a success, why are you focused on one little thing, ye little-minded, impudent fool? <laughs> you just got to find some room, and some of y'all here laughing and they're laughing. There's going to be somebody when Jesus comes back that's going to say, I don't know if I'm ready yet. Can you stop? Because what you're doing, I need something else to do. So the thing about it is, thanks to God, Revelation shows us the vision of blasphemous forces represented by the dragons and the beast who seek to destroy the creation and usurp for themselves the worship due only to God and the Lamb. Do you realize that cults and a lot of things in this world want you to worship them? That's why they got all this. And you write the checks to them. Ain't that amazing? But the thing about it is, all of your worship should be going to God and Jesus. And we can't let the negative forces of this life block our connection to Christ. We cannot let the situations in our lives make us curse God and die. We cannot allow others to tell us that because we struggle, God is not real. There's so many people in this world right now just because somebody died that was close to them think that God is not real. There's so many people who think because somebody is sick or they have an illness that God is not real. Do you realize that God can take anything? Did not. If we if you've been coming to Bible study, we would study, we're studying the book of Acts. And after Stephen was stoned to death, the church got a chance to spread out. There was a diaspora after he was stoned to death. They left that spot. God, whatever we think about the message we had in Bible study, what the enemy meant for evil, God, what? Will work it out for our good. We need to stop looking with earthly eyes at the transparencies and the things that happen in our lives and start to try to look at God to see how these things are trying to transform us to be more heavenly minded so that we can be of more worth on this earth. See, so many people think just because they're going through things, God is not getting to them. Actually, they're going through those things. It's kind of like different cuts of meat. Some meat you cut real, cut real quick. Some meat you got to braise it, then cook it in the oven, then pray that you can still cut it when you're done. The thing about it is, is this. Sometimes we're blocking our blessing because we're focused on trying to do something that God does not want us to do. And how do you know this? Say, Pastor, how do you know this? Because every time you try to do it, it don't go right. And some of us don't learn. Some people don't understand. Mm -hmm. You understand that old story about when the baby touched the stove one time and won't touch it again? Yeah, you're right. But because they, they're not, unless the baby is really stupid. Now, some of y'all, and I ain't talking about you if you was that baby. I keep that to yourself. But the thing about it is, most of the time, when we hurt ourselves, we tend to learn from that. And until we engage in life, we won't know what pain is to know the certain things we're not supposed to do. Oftentimes, we're so focused on trying to have a plan for something that we never consulted God to get this plan. And then we let people tell us that God is not real because the plan didn't manifest. That ain't the plan that God has for you. 
People get caught up with God not answering my prayers because you ain't praying the prayers that he wants you to have. Because if you notice in God's archetypal prayer, it says, let thy will be done. That means his will, not yours. The things you're praying for are your will. What Terry A. Webb won't matters not. It's what does God want for Terry A. Webb. If truth be told, most of us in here, God is blessed in any kind of way. The blessing that you got didn't come the way that you thought it was going to come. It came in the way that God wanted it to come so you would, guess what, know that he is in charge. We cannot let ourselves become so busy that we cannot make time to worship God. There's so many people not trying to be entrepreneurial. And I know I said entrepreneurial. Everybody don't want to work for nobody. But everybody's so busy, they don't want to do no work for God. They so full of it. Whatever it is, you figure it out. But the thing about it is, is this. We cannot be so busy that we can never find time for God. Because if you haven't really been listening, he found time to let you breathe. He found time to let you have life and being. He found time to give you something to eat this morning. Yeah. Your teeth either rented or yours. You ate. <laughs> it matters not. God has blessed you with so many things and you're in your being and giving you things and people around you to care for you. And the thing about it is, some of us, if we really be truthful, we're really crass, crude individuals and there's somebody that God put in our lives that still loves us. Yes. Amen. Some people just have a hustler mentality with a foolish outlook. And people still love them. Uh-huh. Their mama still cried at their funerals. Oh. Partly because she made that mess. But still, the thing about it is, <laughs> we cannot leave God out of our lives. Yeah. And the thing about it is, something we have to understand from this passage of scripture to the elders. Think about this. The elders are li- and the living creatures are worshiping God. And I'm going to explain to you what those are in a minute. See, those who will not humble themselves and accept Christ as their Savior will bow down to the beast. This is why I love it when I hear these young people, can't nobody tell me what to do. Then all of a sudden their favorite color is orange and they tell them when to go to the bathroom, when to do everything. The thing about it is you always will answer to somebody in some way, shape, or form. Everybody answers to somebody. I love it when we get these people, can't nobody tell me what to do. Well, I tell you what. A time is coming that you're going to be in eternity doing what somebody wants you to do and you might not even want the outcome from what's going to happen because you're going to torture it like that for all of eternity. If you cannot listen to anyone, then you can't help anyone. All right. If you cannot listen to anyone, then you cannot grow. You cannot change. I love it when people say, you don't understand what I've been through. I won't if you won't tell nobody what you've been through and stop living in where you were and see where you are right now. It's just like a plant that we're going to buy for our yards in, in March and April. They're being transplanted from where they are right now into a new yard. And guess what? Every time you feed and water that plant, that plant ain't never left you a notice to say, where did I come from? <laughs> the thing about it is, there are people who will be unwilling to reconcile with God. Their sin means more to them than their salvation. Their ability to humble themselves and admit they are broken and need Christ is real. But they don't want to accept it. Because they feel that they are actually captain of their fate and master of their destiny. See, I don't want anybody to get it twisted. God don't want us to be weaklings. God don't want us to be weaklings that are in the corner cowering down just because life ain't going the way we want to go. God wants us to live victoriously. That is claiming faith and doing the things that he wants us to do. Our faith and our victory should be tied up in what God wants for us. Letting his will be done if you're on your way to glory. Yeah. See, there are individuals who believe that it is in their best interest to keep doing what they want to do because they like doing it. Even if God is against it. See, in this passage, in this chapter, we're shown that true worship is centered on God, the creator. Do you understand if I had a graphic, I can show you have this throne right here. That from all life and hope and destiny emanates. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit there. And you have the 24 elders, and you have the four creatures that are there, that are beings, and they worship God in spirit and in truth consistently, constantly, all the time. People wonder why they have crowns, because these people are positioned in power. 
But when you're in the presence of God, I don't care what degree you got. I don't care what position you got. Right. You might call yourself pole mark, grand potentate. Yeah. You might call yourself king of the world, empire, dictator. You might call yourself despot king. You might call yourself anything. You might even think that you're emperor, or the emperor. I don't care who you are. If you are all that stuff on earth, when you get to glory, you ain't nothing. For the child of God. They lay down their crowns because they look good to us, but understand whatever position, whatever perceived power you think you have, God allowed you to have it. And if He can get it, He can take it away. And saints of God, we need to realize that heaven is not some distant planet far out there in the atmosphere somewhere, in the stratosphere, whatever that nerd stuff is about astronomy. But the thing about it is, heaven is another dimension of existence right here and now. It is a realm beyond our senses today because angels and spirits are in here with us right now. They're in here with us right now. They can see and interact with us, but we can't see and interact with them. Because right. we ain't ready yet. Because a corrupted body can't inherit right. the kingdom of God. It is a realm beyond our senses. And when John saw the door open into heaven, he was permitted to see the dimension that is present all the time. I'm just saying that. Which governs the visible affairs of earth. Some of us in here like me can relate to the fact that you were in a car accident and you don't know why the car didn't hit you. You might have slid off the road. You might have stopped two inches from going off the bridge. I ain't got that time. But the thing about it is, angels watching over me. Some of y'all drank something you know you couldn't drink. Some of y'all did some drugs that didn't hug you back. Some of y'all did some stuff in life that you know was incredibly hazardous and dangerous under the pretense of fun. See, the thing about it is, thanks to God, God was watching over you even before you were saved. Because our God is waiting to redeem us. Redemption is what Jesus is all about, trying to get us together. And see, the thing about it is, in this, this, this earth, the biblical position from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, what John saw is that he was taken into a high spiritual dimension of existence called heaven. And he says that once I was in the spirit, it's going to be instantaneous. That's why it's not in the Bible. They say in the twinkle of an eye or a spark, you will be transfigured to be gone. What did he see? The first thing he saw was central to everything else. He saw a great throne and someone sitting on it. So for all those skeptics out there who said that there is no God, he is there. And he is real. Yeah. People are like, ah, ain't no God. If it was a God, why are we living in this world like we are? Well, you know what? God in his divine providence gave us something called free will. Why are there people who don't affiliate with church anymore that have been in church all their lives, but all of a sudden now because of visible enemy, they still go to BJ, Sam's Club, Walmart, they still go to uh, all these other places, go shopping, go out places, go to drive through food stuff, always eating out of restaurants, going all these different places, going to the casino, going everywhere else they want to go. But for some reason, they can't come to church. They go to weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals, and birthday parties, and family gatherings, and barbecues. And some of them going to juke joints and have house clubs and everything else. But they just think just because they're at the end of the bar and the germs are not there with them. The thing about it is it's really astounding to me how people will find a way to always stop them taking back. The people that love Jesus don't take the church out of them. See, the thing about it is we've always had a bunch of posers in the church. All right. We've always had posers in the church because the devil come to church. All right. They do everything else. I have total respect for you. For the past seven months, you've never left your house. You never went to a funeral. You never went to a wedding. You never went to shopping. You never went anywhere. I don't care if it was early for seniors. Why did you go? The germs are still there. Everything is still out there. You go outside your yard and go, you sucked in something. You better have the spirit of God living within you so they can shield God and protect you. But he said the thing about it is, he said he found himself suddenly in the supreme headquarters and he saw the throne was occupied and someone was sitting there being God and immediately our expectation should be heightened. Because no matter what we're going through in this world, I love it when the old Negro spiritual is saying the by and by. Because we know that no matter what we're going through right now, that when this walk is over, we will be rewarded because of our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we think about that throne of God, you should get excited. Yeah. Every once in a while, you should be crying while you're praying because you're sitting there thinking about it. You want to have 
an experience with God. I don't know about you, but I know oftentimes, sometimes, not all the time, but when I pray, I get caught up in prayer so much that I forget how much time has went by. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? God is so good. I forget that my knees hurt. And I just get caught up in prayer. And I'll be 20, 25, 30, 40 minutes later because I'm communing with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he's enriching my life and touching my spirit, giving me the strength to push on against all these idiots who are simply trying to despitefully use me in this world. Worshiping with God takes time. You can't jump down. Jesus will get back up and think you're going to go out to the world and be a black samurai. You need to spend time. And another thing with this too. Saints of God and worshiping God in spirit and truth and trying to get around this throne. Just like some of us have been cleaning out our house, we need to clean out some of those garbage people in our lives who are stopping us from being around the Christ that we need to be around. If somebody's telling you that God ain't real, somebody telling you you can't spend time with God, somebody telling you you can't watch service, go to service, somebody telling you that you should not be giving money to the church, somebody telling you you can't help somebody that's not doesn't have your last name. Well, that's why they say mamas, baby, papas, maybe. I ain't worried about all that. You ain't got to have my last name. Truth be told, some of us have people with our last name. You go, oh Lord. <laughs> oh, right, sir. Right. You know we got a sense of humor too. But the thing about it is, but and see, and it lasts. He starts to get a look at what the throne looks like. And see here, have you ever wondered what God looks like? See, people always go, what does God look like? Is he black? Is he white? Is he Asian? I'm going to tell you what he looks like. Perfect eternity. Now, have you ever wondered? Yes, I have. I wondered what he looked like. I wondered would he be tall. I wondered would he be short. I wondered would he be muscular like me. Keep it to yourself. I wonder <laughs> would he be corpulent like some people. I wonder. But see, but John is permitted to see God on his throne. And the thing about it is, People get caught up and they misinterpret this stuff. What John saw was colors. Yes. He saw effigies. He didn't see any facial features. People get caught up with God look like this. Don't believe anything is painted anywhere about what Jesus looked like. I mean what God looks like. Don't nobody know what God looked like. He and I'm gonna explain that. And it says right here, he appeared as colors like flashing, like jewels, burning, flashing, pure colors. God is light, and in him there is no what? Darkness. See, if you remember, if you read further in Revelation, in heaven there is no night. Because, you know, we all heard some songs about it. The freaks come out at night. You know what happens at night. People get bold at night. They start talking crazy stuff, doing things. Because they think they're under the shadow of darkness when they're really working for the prince of evil. And then 1 John 1, 5 says that. And so perhaps he's remembering the cascading colors that, that reflected the majesty and glory of God. Moses was told, no man can see the face of God and live. Woo, people seem to forget that in Exodus 33, 20. No one has ever seen God at any time. So you see those people die, I saw God. Yeah, right. Now, but at any time, all that man may see are manifestations of his being, which tell us his attributes and his glory. That's what we see. That Deacon Dean talked about that, how we know God is real, because everything grows up. Amen. Except humans. John saw a figure seated upon the throne, but he could not see his features through the dazzling lights that danced around the throne. Ezekiel saw the same thing. The first chapter of his prophecy records a vision like this one. But no one could ever describe God's features, for God is more than a man. He manifests himself in these wonderfully significant colors, and the colors are full of meaning. It's not just the Father whom John sees on the throne. It is noteworthy that there are three of them mentioned. There's Jasper, Carnelian, and Emerald. Check this out. The first one, Jasper, which is really another word for diamond. Diamond is the most beautiful of all gems because it has the ability to capture light and flash and brilliant display of colors. Have you noticed? There was a lot of colors in the description of heaven. See, this is also, too, why diamonds are a girl best friend. For those of you in the man get you a big ring, you don't work as much. But however, your hand gets real strong every time you go somewhere. Oh, can I get that? Oh, oh. yeah, my dad is here. Ooh, yeah, uh-huh. He give you a little ring, you start leaning your finger a little bit, trying to catch a little light on it so it look bigger than what it is. But they are, it is what it is, but a diamond is beautiful, small or large. 
And now we even got simulated diamonds. This is the real thing, baby. <laughs> Brilliant crystal reflects the dominant attribute of God, the Father, his holiness, and his perfection. A perfect diamond is nearly priceless in the eyes of a person. He is a perfect diamond reflecting the perfection of the Father. He's always exactly what anyone can imagine perfection to be. The diamond speaks for the Father and the holiness of our Father, God. Mm -hmm. Then you get to the second one, the carnelian or sardius stone, which is blood red in color. Mm -hmm. If you've ever read the resurrection story, mm -hmm. it's about blood. Mm -hmm. This is about the son, the lamb that was slain for our sins. The redemptive nature of this is amazing. The atonement for our sins was made by the shedding of blood. So the carnelian or sardius stone is representation of the Lamb of God, that is Jesus. Then you have the third color, which was the emerald. Now the emerald that John saw was a great rainbow circling the green, the throne green as an emerald. But green is the color of nature and creation. The rainbow was first seen at the flood of Noah after this terrible holocaust that wiped out the world at the day of the flood. Noah, for the first time, saw in the sky a rainbow. Not a green rainbow. I'm going to make that very clear. But a rainbow of various colors, just as those we see today in a mist or rain. See, this rainbow was the promise of grace expressed in nature. Never again, God said, will I ever visit the earth with the universal flood. Genesis 9, 9 to 26. Never again, that is God's grace shown in that emerald. God's grace unmerited favor. Yeah. See, this rainbow with various shades of green circling the throne speaks of the Holy Spirit administering the holiness and the redemption of God to all of creation. I don't know about you if you're aware of the fact that a rainbow is really a circle. We only see the part from horizon to horizon. If you ever have the privilege of being in a plane and you're riding above a storm, you will see a beautiful rainbow. you see that it's cyclic. It has no beginning and no end. The Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit is here and is looking out for us. And about the only time you will see the whole thing is in a plane. It theologically is enlightening when you're in the plane flying through the storm, you look out and see a rainbow. Guess what? You're flying above the storm. Mm -hmm. And through the grace of God in our lives, we oftentimes fly above the storms of life. It is a promise of grace during the storms of life. And then next, John sees the companion of God. The court of elders. He see 24 elders sitting around, 12 and 12, around the throne. And most scholars believe, because we don't really know for sure, but we believe that representation of 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. And the thing about it is they represent the before and after the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died for both the Jew and the Gentile. But see, the thing about it is, don't look at it just from a mathematical perspective. What it's really saying is that these people had high honor and esteem. And the thing about it is, they let us know that the redeemed of the Lord will worship God. Amen. That means that we too will worship God. The lightning and the thunder are associated with the events of heaven. Have you ever noticed that whenever lightning and thunder happens that you look up? It's not by coincidence. I remember growing up, I never understood when old people would tell us when it was raining and the sun was shining and the devil was whooping his wife. I didn't think the devil would get married, and I don't know what woman would marry. Mm. Let me think, come back to you on that one. But, uh, got some suggestions. But, uh, nobody at this church. Now, but I want us to understand something here. Saints of God, real worship centers things for you. Real worship is what this experience is all about. And don't think I forgot about the, the beings with the lights. Understand this here. Let me go to do them now. Because I know some of y'all, what does this mean? I'm going to get to it about the beings and all this other good stuff and what they are and all this. I know we won't understand what this is. Let me do this. I'm going to do this. Because I was getting excited. And the living creatures represent the qualities of God. The, the crystal clear sea represents another quality of the holiness of God. God don't hide anything. He's not a magician where he got a card behind his back, one up his sleeve, whatever. God is up front. God is everything. See, the living creatures represent the qualities and character of God. Don't look at them as if they're just actually creatures. These, these are metaphors. 
The characters symbolized by the creatures in the animal presence symbolize the omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence of God. See, you have the lion symbolizing the power and the strength of God and the majesty. Then you have the ox representing the faithfulness. You have the human symbolizing the intelligence. You have the eagle symbolizing the sovereignty. Eagles soar when they fly. And you understand this too. I know people wonder, well, what are the six wings for? If you don't, if you wouldn't question it, you should. Now, that lets you know too that these creatures have six wings. But check this out. They have two wings to cover their eyes, for no one may look upon God. They have two wings to cover their feet, for no one may walk upon consecrated the holy ground. And they have two to fly with. Do you understand? Remember Moses had to take off his shoes right. to walk on his land? Mm -hmm. Nobody can look upon or walk upon consecrated land. So in essence, the book of Revelation in this chapter instructs us on how to worship. You need to be looking towards God in your worship. When you talk about praying, ask God to open your heart and your mind be willing to receive. Stop looking at your bills and look at God's will. Amen. All right. Because Christmas time is coming. Your kid doesn't have to have the new PlayStation. Your kid don't have to have new clothes. Your kid needs that stuff, then get it. Yo, you know what your child needs? Somebody to love them and reprove them and teach them how to be the right kind of person. So you teach them, train them, and the way they should go, they get old, they will not depart. I know people saying, Pastor, that's just mean. Guess what? Many of us in here, truth be told, that is 55 and over, has some Christmases that's very lean. I mean like Nutrisystem lean. <laughs> there was no carbohydrates. <laughs> There was no meat, no substance. But you got together and you ate. Amen. And you had time with family. Yes, right. It's not about giving things if you're not giving them Jesus. All right. Oftentimes we try to supplant giving people ourselves and our love with giving them the next PlayStation. Mm -hmm. Or giving them the next whatever game thing it is out there. Or giving them the next purse or shoes or whatever. If you really want to know the truth, God wants you to be a good steward of what he's given you. I think it is absolutely a bad investment to pay more than $50 for a pair of tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. People are like, what? You can't do that. If you stop buying them at $200, they will become $50. Right. If you stop right. buying them at $50, they will become $20. Right. There is no reason in any given way that you should pay $200 for a pair of shoes for somebody that's not making a million dollars a year to wear them. So what are we doing with this money? People wonder, well, why don't I have what I have? Because you waste what God gave you. There is no reason. There is no reason. I see guys running around with $200 basketball shoes on, and the only thing they can dribble is the spit on their lips. <laughs> now, if you're a grown person, and you are financially able to buy these things, and you go out and do it, but a kid doesn't need those things. A kid needs you to love them. A kid needs you to take care of them. A kid needs you to be a mother and a father. Amen. Because many of us in here grew up and we didn't always have that stuff. Amen. As I said last week, a lot of us, you had school clothes, church clothes, Amen. and clothes that you can't wear no more that you played in. We didn't have all that stuff. And guess what? We grew up to be sanctioned, successful adults. Many of our homeowners retired from jobs. You're still working. And guess what? Some of us are blessed enough to help the losers in our family take care of their kids. Amen. So y'all laughing because everybody got some losers in their family. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And though, that's our ministry. Yeah. To look out for them idiots who keep do who stuck on stupid and can't look past forever dumb. <laughs> that's ministry. It is what it is. Everybody ain't perfect. We all got some issues. The thing about it is that real worship gathers us together. I love when people say they love God, but they never come to church. Right. I, I love when people say I love God, but I don't have to go to church. You go to work, you go to club meetings, you go to everything else. Why can't you come to church? Oh, I, I, I don't need to do that. Oh. Yeah, you do. Because it's forsake not the fellowship. Because you come to church around like-minded believers, your perspectives on life might change. Because in church, you have people with testimonies, you have people who've been tried, you have people who've been victorious, that you can actually work with, talk with, spend time with. Some of the most enriching experiences in my life have been with people in church. And yes, I've been to churches where people have been severely hurt. I've been hurt by people in church. But you know what? If you can't take a punch, how do you know you're going to stand up? 
The thing about it is, we can't focus on that. Real worship puts us together and it teaches us what family and congregation is about and it crosses the lines of exclusion. I don't have to be rich, I can be poor. I don't have to be pretty, I can be the opposite. I don't have to be thin, I can be the opposite. See, I'm being politically correct. I don't have to have the best clothes, I just got some clothes. It is what it is. God only after who you are. All this don't matter. The thing about it is, real worship is revelatory. If we actually spent time worshiping God, God would open our eyes up to see things from another perspective. When I opened up this service today, I said, pray for somebody you don't like. Because when you start praying for people you don't like, we start to understand where they're coming from. People always try to make fun, downplay other people they really don't understand, but you really don't understand what they've been through. You don't understand, well, why do they act like that? If you have been through what they've been through, I don't even know if you might not want to take your own life. The thing about it is we always look at the people trying to make them to be something that we want them to be instead of who they are. Do you understand that if you rub elbows with the right people long enough, eventually you know what right is and then you can start to be right? Mm-hmm. How will you know what right is if nobody around you is doing right? You can only be what you see. You can only do what you know. So in essence, real worship is revelatory. It empowers you to see things you never saw before. And now you begin to understand. You start to understand the familiar patterns of life and they take on a new meaning. You now understand that you can't go out and do everything you want to do until you pay your bills. You can't get mad at people that can't loan you money and you ain't got none either. You start to understand love is not just physical. You start to understand that holding on to your faith has benefits. You start to understand that when you're going through things, God is preparing you for the next destination he has for you. You realize the struggle makes you better, able to deal with the problems of life. You start to realize until you fall in love with Jesus, that you may fall for a fool and waste a whole lot of precious time. Real worship teaches us how to look at life from the eyes of God and to see possibilities instead of impossibilities. Real worship allows us to be able to sing songs. There's nothing more disheartening than to meet somebody who gets up in the morning mad because they had to get up. Do you know what you got up? Thank God. I ain't had my coffee, but you had breath. You still had life. And most of us at age nine, you get up, you know your kidneys still work because you got to get there. The thing about it is, it is what it is. God is blessing you. When you leave out to go to your job and your job is working your nerves, God is working on you. You never know what he's preparing you for for the next destination in life. We want everything to be easy, breezy, peasy. Everything ain't easy, breezy, peasy. If it was, what we need to have faith for. God is working on us to get us to be willing to stand strong on his promises and his words and not focus on our weaknesses. Oh, I love it too when you're around people who don't really worship God. They always can tell you about what you can't do, but they're never going to do anything for you. All right. Or the church. See, the thing about it is real worship makes you sing, and Christians should always be singing, making a joyful noise in the midst of all their trouble and their joy. And if you know it says make a joyful noise, it means nothing about being on key. And for some of y'all, it's sad to say even black people being on beat. What matters most is that you make a joyful noise. See, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. The way I feel on the inside is coming on the outside. It's because of the joy I have because of my Savior, who thought enough of me to save a wretch like me. God accepted me when the world rejected me. And there are many songs in the book of Revelations, even though it has judgment, and sometimes some things that are blood letting it in. But Christians can sing when others are weak. Christians can stand strong when others are weak because of their faith. Christians know from where their help comes from. Christians know that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And one day will honor with the wings of an eagle and soar above every stank, nasty problem that this world can throw at. You will one day be victorious in all that you do. You just hold on to God's unchanging hands and you worship God in spirit and in truth. And real worship is affirming. If you really study God, you will know that what you're going through is temporary in comparison to eternity. 
You know what? You will learn to say amen even when the troubles begin. Amen. You will learn to say yes when you really want to say no. You will learn to worship God when it hurts and you will learn to worship God when you feel happy. You will know that you know that you know who you know that can do anything but fail. Worship takes our minds off our problems and facilitates us smoking and singing on God and singing glory. Worship encourages us not to be individuals. See, the thing about it is you can't worship God all alone. So many people think they can really go off somewhere by themselves and they really believe that Bedside Baptist is really a part of the Baptist denomination. But to be part of corporate worship is a, a, a revelatory experience because you need to be around the brethren and the sisterin to know what it is to live in this real world. We're auditioning now for heaven. We're being prepped now for that journey to heaven. If we can't live with each other now, what are we going to do on the other side? Yes. See, worship lifts our earthly, finite perspective to a heavenly perspective that looks past our faults and sees our needs and our hope and knows that with God all things are possible. Worship helps all creatures in heaven and earth to praise and honor God because he is the creator and sustainer of everything. Know that worship reminds us that whatever we're facing, God is with us. Whatever we're going through, God is with us. No matter how dark it might be outside, God is with us. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to walk around the streets of heaven all day. When I get to heaven, I'm going to see my Jesus. When I get to heaven, I'm going to experience grace and joy beyond anything that I've ever encountered on this earth. When I get to heaven, I will be able to do things I never saw because of my God, my God, my God, all things are possible. Why? Because I'm saved by the blood of the man. I have wonderfully saved and I am so glad heaven is my goal. Each and every day I've got to keep moving in the right way. If I stumble, if I stumble, don't hinder me. Get out of my way. But my God will pick me up. Just me and start me back on my way again. So step aside. I don't need nobody to block in my way. I don't need anybody stopping me from my God. But I'm running to the Lord. It ain't dead beyond sometimes. But I know my God is on my side. My heart is fixed and my mind is made up. I won't let nobody stop me from going after my God because heaven is my God. Thank <laughs> you.
the world has let you go. There's no way worshiping God makes it all possible. That is why some of us come into church and we lose our natural mind. Because the world has done things to us that are just unconscionable. Some of us got some ignorant bosses. Some of us got some crooked co-workers. Some of us got some ignorant booze. Some of us got some crazy issues going on in our lives. Some of us think we can make our children act right. Some of us are going up slippery slopes, not standing understanding that God wants you to stop what you don't. Yes. And listen to him. Yes. And let him redirect you. Yes. Is there anyone in here that knows that God has been good to you? Yes. Is there anyone in here that knows God has kept you? Is anybody here that knows God has kept you when you were young? I remember when you was dating your people, your mama told you not to date. When you was crazy. And when God kept you when you was being lazy. When you were being rebellious. When you were drunk driving. When you were smoking weed from somebody who didn't know who you bought it from. Sometimes we need to shout sometime during worship. Sometimes we need to be just like those creatures and say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He alone is worthy of our praise and our worship. Want to know why? He put coals on our back. He put shoes on our feet. He put money in our pocket. He put a in ourselves. He put sin in our head. And guess what? Some of us in our right mind and God still taking care of us. He saved you. He saved you. Some of us don't want you. That's why you can clap your hands on your feet. I know my Jesus can be me. Hallelujah to God. Thank you somebody like me. My God's been good to me.
to be at that meeting around the throne. Yeah. You're going to need to give your life to Christ. You're going to need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because we all need to worship God in spirit and in truth. But first, you have got to be saved. You have got to accept Jesus and let him know that you love him. Let him know that he is your all in all. Because saints, can't nobody do you like Jesus. He woke you up this morning and started you on your way. In your right mind and clothes. And when you leave here, you're going to have some place to return to. Not because of your job, but because of his grace and his mercy. As we open the doors of this church, surrender yourself to God. And let God have his way with you. Let God have his way with you. There's nothing that you can't do that God can't have. There's nothing that you can't do that you should be ashamed of. God is there. But I know that my God is there. And he's waiting to deliver you and take care of you. Surrender yourself to Jesus right now. Don't put it off. You need to give your life to Christ. While his blood is still running warm in your veins, know that God is able and that God is willing and he is waiting on you. Surrender it all, surrender. Yes, yes, yes.